happens. So we will have. AMD, do you have any idea if it slows things down? It's online rounds. I'm sorry I'm dark. I, I've been trying to play with the background lighting, but it's just so bright uh, where I am in the background. I apologize. Um, we will be keeping uh, all of the audience participants on mute. And the purpose of that is just to minimize background noise so that everyone can hear well. But that doesn't mean you have to remain muted. Everyone has the capacity to unmute themselves. And when Jonathan asks questions, or if you have questions, please do feel free to participate and unmute yourselves. Um, there is also a chat function on the side where you can chat, where you can send messages to the group or privately to any one individual. Um, I will also keep an eye on that. Uh, before I, before I um, introduce our speaker, I think Sharif just wanted to say a, a brief welcome as well. Well, just a, a welcome to everyone. Thanks for uh, joining in. Uh, this has been uh, uh, really an unprecedented time for us. Uh, um, it's a huge international um, uh, public health uh, crisis, probably the biggest we'll, we'll ever see in our lifetimes. And, and it's put a tremendous amount of stress on, on everybody. And it's uh, been wonderful to see how uh, so many uh, of us have stepped up and so many uh, docs and uh, uh, everybody uh, uh, is stepping up. Uh, it, it's really nice to see these rounds come into play. I think education helps put some normalcy back into our lives and uh, I'm certainly looking forward to hearing these rounds. So thanks for uh, uh, participating and thanks to Jonathan for presenting these and I'll turn these uh, over to uh, John Lloyd, our program director. So yes, I'm very excited that you're all here. And uh, it's also exciting to me to set a new record for attendance at uh, rounds in my seven years. This is best attended rounds to date. So anyway, I hope, uh, <clears throat> I hope the attendance will continue going forward. Uh, and I'm quite intrigued by this uh, means of delivering rounds and this technology. And I wanna give a shout out to Am and Deep for doing such a fabulous job, making getting it up and running so quickly. Uh, special thanks of course, to our speaker, Jonathan Michelli, who's, uh, you know, taken this on a relatively short notice. So um, just to introduce him, he's, of course, a graduate from our program. And he uh, then completed his neuro-ophthalmology fellowship at Emory University in Atlanta, 2017 to 2018. So he practices his neuro-ophthalmology at the Kensington Eye Institute and, um, and also at St. Michael's Hospital. And of course, he loves teaching medical students, and he's particularly good at teaching our medical students at residence. He has many, uh, many pearls and easy to remember ways of dealing with some of the complex neuro-ophthalmology issues. Uh, his main interests are um, actually he's quite a sporty guy and, and one of his main interests is his eye protection in both amateur and professional sports and of course he's very interested in the use of OCT in neuro-ophthalmology and also visual outcomes in idiopathic intracranial hypertension. So welcome Jonathan, thank you for uh, leading off our inaugural Grand Rounds on Zoom. Okay, thank you for the introduction. Um, I'd just like to echo those sentiments. Thanks for organizing this, and uh, thanks to M&D for inviting me. So well, I have uh, three, three cases to present today. Um, the first one is uh, a guy with a swollen eyelid, and you can see in my next couple of cases, I tried to give them movie titles, and so we'll see how, how that goes. Um, before we start, let's just take a quick poll. Let's try out the um, polling of Zoom here. So I'm going to start off with a question here. So just tell us who you are here. So all these votes are anonymous, so we can just get an idea of who's, who's joining us today. I'll keep that open for another 10 seconds. So it looks like we have over 180 people joining us, which is great. Okay, so most of us here are ophthalmology and ophthalmology residents, but we have uh, you know, some medical students, researchers, and uh, even some neurologists too. So let's try uh, another poll here. Let's just get an idea of our audience here. So where is everybody from? Okay, so it looks like we have uh, mostly Toronto, but there are people, seems like a lot of people outside Ontario. Okay, great, so let's get started. And we're gonna start with our first case, which is a patient who had vision loss after a swollen eyelid. 
So this is a 40 year old man who's referred to us for right eye vision loss and he is healthy, not taking any medications at the time we were seeing him. So when he's sitting in my chair, this is the history that I get. He tells me he had one month of right eyelid swelling and rash. So he presented to the emergency room and he was treated with antibiotics for seven days and the swelling of his eyelid improved. So he saw an ophthalmologist and he was prescribed a couple of eye drops. He tells me one of them was for pressure in his eye and the second was for inflammation. And then at his follow-up appointment, things seemed to be better. So they started to taper off his eye drops. So one month after the onset of swelling, he developed severe vision loss in his right eye. And he mostly noticed that the vision loss was in the central part of his visual field. So he saw an ophthalmologist who noticed that he had a visual acuity of hand motions in the right eye, 20-20 in the left eye, and everything else seemed normal in the eye. So he, re he was referred to us through the emergency room at St. Michael's Hospital, and this is where ophthalmology and our program first has contact with him. So on the first exam by ophthalmology, he had a visual acuity of hand motions in his right eye, and he was 20-20 in his left eye. There was a right RAPD that was noticed. And he did have a little bit of inflammation in his anterior segments. Just a few cells were noticed in the anterior chamber. The dilated eye exam was normal. Now these are the anterior segment photos we have of this patient. And you'll notice that the temporal part of his right eye is injected. So there was some redness there, but the, the cornea looks clear and the media is otherwise clear. So the dilated eye exam also looked pretty good. So his optic nerves look normal, the retina look normal, and the peripheral retina all look normal. Now, because he was describing mainly central vision loss, the uh, patient was brought back for an IVFA and OCT to see if there was any other retinal lesion or retinal cause that could explain his vision. So here is the IVFA. And to me, and also the retina specialist, this looked normal. So we can see on the late frame, there's a little bit of non-specific late leakage, but this would all be considered within normal limits and not uh, explanatory of the vision issue. So we get an OCT of the macula here and it's also normal. So this is how the patient ends up in neuro-ophthalmology. So I have the patient's consent to share this case and he did also consent to showing the um, pictures of his face when he first came in. So this is, when he's sitting in my chair, this is what I see. So maybe m and do we want to ask a resident to just comment on the picture here and tell us what they think the rash initially was from? Sure. Um, let me pick. Let's go with Amrit. Sure. Um, so... Maybe uh, actually the wrong person to ask because he saw yeah, this patient. Yeah, I saw this patient. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's go with, I'm just going through the list here, Anish. Oh, wrong person too. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I'm just going so, alphabetical order here. Angela. <laughs> well, just looking at this photo, um, there definitely seems to be some small, possibly vesicular looking lesions in the V1 distribution, and also possibly some rash at the tip of the nose, a possible Hutchinson sign. So I'm definitely thinking about herpes zoster as part of my differential, and it does seem to be respecting the vertical midline as well. Okay, good. So let's launch the poll and see if, if people agree with this or not. Are you able to uh, start the poll? Hold on, give me one second here. Um, poll two, or no, poll three. Poll three. Yes. There we go, it should be up now. Okay, well, let's, let's move on. So as Angela said here, um, the first thing I noticed here is this patient has a lesion, as you can see on the right side of his nose that looks, um, and you can also see a couple more as he turns his head to the right here. 
So because all of these changes seem to be on the right side of his face, we are now worried about a herpes zoster. And so the patient was actually kind enough to send us a selfie of when he first presented, and you can see how the changes are much more dramatic here. So there's a crusted lesion on the right side of his nose and the tip of his nose, and also you can see near the medial canthus here and on his eyelid. So let's just briefly review the anatomy of, the, of V1. And so it's important to remember that there's three main branches of V1. There's the frontal, lacrimal, and nasal ciliary branch. Now, when we're talking about herpes zoster, the nasal ciliary branch often comes up, and that's because this uh, branch carries the sensation to the side and tip of the nose, and it also innervates the cornea. So when a patient is seen that has uh, lesions on the side of their nose or tip of their nose, this implicates the nasal ciliary nerve. And because this nerve innervates the cornea, these patients are at high risk for ocular involvement. So this is where the primary care physicians or the emergency doctors definitely want to refer these patients to ophthalmology. So this is called Hutchinson sign, and this is a strong predictor of ocular inflammation and, um, and eye involvement in HZO. So when we saw the patient, we reviewed his records, and indeed his right eyelid swelling was diagnosed as HZO in the emergency department. He was treated with Valtrex, one gram POTID for 10 days. And then when the ophthalmologist saw him in follow-up, he was noted to have a hypertensive uveitis. So he was started on Predforte and Combigan eye drops. So when we saw him, he was hand motions in his right eye. He had a right RAPD. There was just one cell per high powered field based on the slit lamp examination. And we did notice the right temporal episcleritis, but the examination was otherwise normal. And you can see here the fundus photos, which show normal appearing optic nerves, macula, and its peripheral retina was also normal. And you can see here that the OCT RNFL and ganglion cell complex are also normal thicknesses. So here's his visual field, and you can see just as he described the central vision loss, sorry, the vision loss is mainly central. So he has a very dense central scotoma, and his left visual field is normal. So let's uh, try to launch another poll here. So what is the, or maybe we can ask a PGY2 resident here, what, where is the problem? So how, where is the lesion, and why does this patient have vision loss? Jonathan, I can launch the poll if you want. Okay, you the launch poll. why don't you launch poll four then? It should be up now. Yep, okay. All right, we've got about 100 results. Maybe I'll share it now. Sure. Okay, so the results here, so most people um, got this correct. So most people answered either anterior optic nerve or posterior optic nerve. So the anterior part of the, part of the optic nerve is where we, what we see on our dilated exam, okay? So the anterior optic nerve here was normal. So if someone had an anterior optic neuropathy, the nerve would be swollen. So it's not an anterior optic neuropathy since his optic nerve looked normal. We get a pretty good idea this is not the retina because we have a normal IVFA, we have normal OCT, and the patient has a very dense RAPD, so it wouldn't really explain um, the vision loss. So we know here that the, the localization or the problem here is the retrobulbar optic nerve. So that's the optic nerve behind the globe and in front of the chiasm. So we can say that this patient has a retrobulbar optic neuropathy. So now the question is, what is causing his retrobulbar optic neuropathy? So this patient had HZO, and a month later he has vision loss. So the most likely reason for his vision loss is varicella zoster virus or related to the herpes zoster. Now we still have to keep a differential diagnosis here. So it is possible, you know, maybe this patient is immunosuppressed and we don't know it. So we have to still keep in mind other infectious etiologies such as syphilis. This could be possibly unrelated and it's also possible maybe this, has, this patient has a mass behind the globe that is compressing the optic nerve. These are much less likely, but we just wanna keep it in mind. So the question now is how should we investigate this patient? So at a minimum, this patient needs an MRI of the orbits and brain with contrast, because we want to see exactly what is going on and see what that posterior retrobulbar optic nerve looks like. So that is definitely needed in this case. 
probably the patient should have some other blood tests. I would say at a minimum, the ones in red should be done. So we definitely want to see his creatinine because that has implications for treatment. We should probably test HIV and some other infectious uh, etiologies just to make sure he is not immunosuppressed. Often in these cases, we like to get ID and neurology involved since this is a multi kind of disciplinary case. And in cases where you're not sure, say the rash has resolved or it's happening a little bit later after the HZO, you could consider an AC paracentesis to document um, that it is indeed due to the virus. Now, this patient probably didn't need to have one, but he did have an AC tap. And you can see that even though his eye was quiet and there was, basi there was basically just one or two cells for high power field, there was VZV detected by PCR. So we got him an MRI pretty quickly, and you can see that just as we suspected, the retrobobber optic nerve is being involved. And we can tell that because there's enhancement on the MRI. So this is a T1 MRI with gadolinium. And basically where we see the high signal means there's been breakdown of the blood optic nerve barrier and the contrast agent is getting in. So this tells us there is some inflammation taking place. So the patient also had the other tests we talked about. So he was HIV negative, his syphilis testing was negative. He did have a lumbar puncture and you can see that there was a lymphocytic pleocytosis. This is often what is seen in the herpes zoster optic neuropathy and his protein was a little bit high. We did not detect varicella zoster virus in his CSF, which is often the case for optic neuropathies. So the question here is how should we treat this patient? So um, this one, I mean, Deep, why don't you launch poll five? Okay, it's up. So let's see what people think. If you were faced with this patient here who has a severe vision loss from right retrobulbar optic neuropathy from herpes zoster, how would you treat this patient? But Jonathan, as the poll is running, we do have a question in the chat from Majid asking why a hep C test? Uh, the Hep C test is was just something recommended by ID just to screen for other uh, infectious etiologies. Definitely not needed, but um, I would say Hep B is probably should be done just in case he needs to be treated with steroids. But um, Hep C is not indicated, but something ID recommended. Okay, okay and so I'm going to end the poll here. Okay, so most people said that they would treat the patient with intravenous acyclovir and intravenous steroids. Uh, next in line was intravenous acyclovir, and then some people would treat with oral. So this is a, you know, a, a highly debated topic, and there is no right answer to this. So I think the most important thing here is to get help and discuss the pace with um, your, your ID and neurology colleagues. For sure, this patient needs antivirals. So you could go intravenous or you could go oral. Now, if this patient had other neurological involvement, of course, you'd need to do intravenous. But in this case, there is no good evidence which way to go, but you could go intravenous or oral antivirals. You also want to monitor this patient closely for uveitis and any associated eye changes. And if you're going to treat this patient with antivirals, especially intravenous, you want to watch his creatinine because you can get acute renal failure. Um, you have to be careful in elderly patients or patients who do have renal failure. And if this happens, it usually develops within 48 hours. So our decision here, um, after talking to the patient and ID, we decided to treat the patient with intravenous acyclovir, 10 milligrams IV every eight hours. The reason we did this was to, um, based on the patient and based on his severe vision loss, we didn't really want to take any chances here. So. If you look here, the patient um, was hand motions on January 27th. So we started the intravenous acyclovir, and then three days later, he had a little bit more eye pain, and we noticed there was one plus cells in his anterior chamber, so we had to restart the prednisolone eye drop. When we rechecked him a day later, his vision was much improved. So he's, he's 2080, and you can see his visual field is also much improved. His central scotoma is still present, but it's much less dense. And you can see that on February 4th, he had a really good improvement. So we decided to transition him to oral. And finally, on February 12th, you can see on the right-hand side here, his visual field is essentially normal and he's 2025. And when we saw him in March, he was 2020. So this patient had a dramatic improvement just with intravenous acyclovir. 
So we all know that how herpes zoster comes about. So most of us carry this virus, if not all of us. And when our cell mediated immunity diminishes, the virus comes out and gives us herpes zoster. Now as ophthalmologists, this can basically affect every subspecialty of ophthalmology. And a large proportion of these patients will have cranial dermatomes involved and it can be as dramatic as this patient here. Now optic neuropathy is very rare. So it is seen in less than 1% of cases, and it's much more common to have a cranial neuropathy, and that um, is certainly bears out in our clinical experience. Now, it's not exactly clear why patients get an optic neuropathy. The theories are there's probably direct invasion of the nerve itself, either through transsynaptic or hematogenous routes. It could also be ischemic secondary to VZV vasculitis. And if there's any involvement of the meninges or the brain, it could be from extension into the optic nerve as well. Now, treatment, definitely if this patient has a neurological complication, as the neurologists know, this patient needs prompt intravenous acyclovir. Now, if it is isolated, you can't, there is still debate whether to use intravenous or oral, and that's a decision you need to make with you know, your ID colleagues and with the patient. Also, if there's an isolated cranial nerve like 3, 4, and 6, you, six, you could also um, think about just using oral um, treatment. Now, the question always arises, do we treat these patients with optic neuropathies from VZV with steroids? Now, because the optic neuropathy from herpes zoster is so rare, there really is no good evidence for using steroids, and there is some fear that you could potentially cause harm. Now, just to give you an idea of how rare this is, this is one of the largest case series that we have with six patients that developed herpes zoster optic neuropathy within 30 days of their HZO. And so if you look at the patient characteristics from this case series, you know, the vis presenting visual acuities were quite varied, anywhere from 2030 to NLP. And you can see that the final visual acuity is also very variable. In this case series, they treated four patients with steroids, one of them with intravenous, and you can see this is the type of evidence we need to use to guide ourselves. Um, and you can see that there really is no clear benefit in this series and from other case reports in smaller series when adding steroids to these cases. So the, the visual outcome in herpes zoster optic neuropathy is variable, but you can expect some improvement of cases. Usually it's a modest improvement in about 50% of people. Now, the reason people are afraid to use steroids is because of cases like this. So there are a number of case reports and small case series where a patient, often they're immunosuppressed, presents with an optic neuropathy from varicella zoster virus. Often the retinal involvement is not seen. So the patient has a normal exam or there's very subtle signs. Sometimes these patients get misdiagnosed and they're treated with steroids, or sometimes they're not treated and their retina just explodes and they develop a necrotizing retinitis. And so this is why some people are fearful of using steroids in these cases. Now, there's no good evidence whether we can prevent this by using the combination of antivirals and steroids, but um, this is often the reason why people shy away from using steroids in these cases. And as from our case showed, you usually do get a pretty good response just with antivirals. Now, the next thing that often comes up when you have a patient with a complication from varicella zoster virus is what about vaccination? So I'm just going to briefly remind you that there's two types of vaccines available for herpes zoster virus. There's the recombinant one, which is non-live, the Shingrix and there's Zostavax. So these two um, vaccines have not been compared head to head, but in a meta-analysis, Shingrix was found to be superior in reducing the risk of herpes zoster. So with patients like our patient who had a history of herpes zoster, vaccination is recommended. Now the question is when should they get the vaccination? And there really is no good evidence on this. Most people would wait until the symptoms resolve and some people would even wait up to one year afterwards. This is where your ID colleagues or your primary care um, doctors can help you with this. Most people would favor giving the Shingrix vaccine. Now, I just put up a little table here just to give you a brief comparison between these two. Now, vaccination is recommended for everyone over 50, even without herpes zoster. And vaccination plays no role in uh, treatment. So this is afterwards. 
Now you can see that Shingrix in the uh, clinical trials has shown to be much more effective in reducing um, herpes zoster and post herpetic neuralgia. However, Shingrix has one downside in that you require two doses. So these have to be given anywhere from two to six months apart. Zostavax does have the advantage of being one dose. However, Zostavax is contraindicated in anyone that is immunodeficient. So, um, and you also want to be careful when you're giving this Shingrix to uh, immunocompromised people. This, if they just have a low level of immunosuppression, then it's probably okay to give it. But in high dose, this is where IV needs to weigh in on that. Now, we've been seeing a lot of curves and a lot of epidemiology um, in the news now with the COVID virus, but here's another curve that seems to be increasing dramatically. So you can see this was a very good study done um, in Olmstead County, Minnesota, where they have very good re record keeping. And you can see that there's been over a fourfold increase over 60 years on the incidence of herpes zoster. And no one really knows why this is happening, and there's really no good explanation for this. We know that it cannot be explained by antivirals or the number of immunocompromised individuals. So as ophthalmologists and even neurologists, we're seeing a lot of, we're going to be seeing a lot more of these complications if this curve continues to increase. So I certainly in my practice have been having a lot of neuro-ophthalmological uh, issues related to herpes zoster. Uh, herpes zoster. So you can see here, this is an 89 year old woman who developed right eye blurry vision 20 days after the rash on the right side of her head. Now, unlike our other case, this patient had swelling of the optic nerve. So this is telling us it's an anterior optic neuropathy. In this case, there's more role for an anterior chamber paracentesis because there is a differential diagnosis. And with the you know, segmental optic disc edema, a disc at risk and her vascular risk factors, it is possible this is an anterior ischemic optic neuropathy. So you can see this patient also has an inferior altitudinal defect in the right eye and her MRI is normal. Her AC paracentesis was also normal. So the question is, is this herpes zoster or just NAION? Now, because of COVID, we didn't want her to come back in, but she's at home doing her crossword puzzles. And when we do our telephone follow with her, she's telling us that her crossword puzzles are becoming more clear and clear and it's gone back to normal. So this supports the idea that this really was herpes zoster and the oral antivirals indeed helped her because we do not expect such a dramatic improvement with NAION. So the bottom line here is remember herpes zoster optic neuropathy can happen. It's rare. It usually happens within a month or two of getting the rash on the face. And you definitely want to treat with antivirals, whether you do IV or oral is still up for debate. Use steroids with caution and we usually go to vaccination afterward to prevent um, this from happening again. Okay, are there any questions for this case? So Jonathan, I've, I've unmuted um, John Lloyd and David Rootman who, who have put some comments in the chat box. Sure. Yeah, I, I'm curious if you could do a poll and see how many of us have actually gone and had the Shingrix vaccine. Um, that's one thing. The other thing is I, I, I actually stuck my arm out and had it done and uh, went back three months later and had the second one. I've never had such a terrible flu in my life. I was bedridden for three days with the first shot. And uh, I think that's something you need to warn the patients about because uh, uh, after speaking to some of my friends, uh, who've also gone through it. It's not an uncommon reaction. Yes, that's definitely true. I've, heard, I've definitely heard that before. Um, I'm not sure. Do you know whether people that have, have you had patients that have had the Zostavax and reported something similar? Yes. Uh, yeah. And I've spoken to other people who've, who've had it and had similar reactions. The second one wasn't as bad as the first. And I loaded up on uh, aspirin and uh, acetaminophen um, before I got it, and I sort of stayed on it for two, for 48 hours. But the first one really uh, laid me flat for at least two days. Yeah, and that's I definitely heard that before. Um, John, <clears throat> I have a question for you. These cases are presenting many, many days after their initial uh, herpes. 
So, I mean, it, I guess it's relatively low risk to treat with antivirals and you're certainly showing evidence of presumed benefit, but how do you really know this is not an immune mediated response as opposed to an actual active viral issue? Or do you know? Well, we don't know. So it's possible it's, uh, it is related to that or it's a combination of both. Um, I think, you know, in this case, this patient got dramatically better just with, uh, you know, regular intravenous antivirals. So that argues more in favor of this being a direct viral invasion. However, it's possible that whatever inflammation or associated inflammation he had also just resolved on its own as well. But we don't really know exactly the mechanism on why this happened. And this is why people, you know, are trying to see whether steroids have any benefit. But there really hasn't been any clear benefit to steroids, which argues against the purely, um, you know, immune mediated response. Um, there's a great question here from Hermina. I'm going to see if I can un unmute her. Um, but essentially, she's put in the chat box. Oh, Hermina, are you there? Yes, I am. Hi, how are hey, you? Great to hear from you. Nice to see. Yeah, nice to hear. How are you doing? You want to go ahead and ask your question? We're, we're good. Thank you. So I saw yesterday an uh, 81-year-old female from a long-term facility, which in fact the facility is on lockdown. Um, and she has a, a third nerve palsy with, related to shingles. Like uh, she was diagnosed with shingles two, uh, two weeks ago. And um, she, um, besides she, her eye also has uh, uveitis and corneal edema. Um, basically, she has the eye complete third nerve palsy. So should I do an MRI in this situation? So does the patient have any other neurological symptoms or signs or it's just purely, if it's purely, you know, the ocular involvement and a third nerve palsy, this is where, you know, COVID is presenting us with new um, difficulties. So if this was a normal situation, let's assume there was no COVID, um, this patient should have a MRI and an MRA or CTA. So every third nerve palsy, we need to rule out compression from aneurysm. And we need, and if there's some relationship to herpes zoster, then we should have an MRI to see exactly what's going on and how extensive um, the disease is involved. Now, in this case with COVID, where you have someone in a long-term care facility, um, where you know there's risks on having the patient go to the emergency room and there's risks for having the patient go outside to any facility, I think here you know you have to. Um, you know, make a decision and you may have to talk to the patient about this. I think in your case, if you're having a third nerve palsy with a clear temporal relationship to herpes zoster ophthalmicus, we know that the likely diagnosis is, um, you know, herpes zoster ophthalmicus related third nerve palsy. So, you know, it's, this is a difficult case. In this case, you know, probably given the risks of COVID, you would, I would definitely put this patient on, um, you know, oral antivirals and you would treat her eyes with whatever topical medications are indicated. Um, and then you could, you know, you could closely monitor. There's no, you know, real right answer to this question. And I guess you have to discuss with the patient and their caregivers on wh exactly what risks you're willing to take. But it's probably, it is probably reasonable to um, just treat this patient with oral antivirals. If you have access to a lab, you probably want to get some blood testing. At least her creatinine should be measured, I think. Um, at some point during the treatment. But this is obviously a difficult case that, you know, there's no right answer, but given, you know, the circumstances right now, I think it's, it is reasonable to treat just with the antivirals and monitor her. Mm -hmm. I started her on Valtrex and um, steroids drops. So I will see yeah. her next week and see how she's doing. Yeah, that's, clear, that's certainly reasonable. Thank you. Okay, so, so um, maybe we'll we'll move on um, just because we have a couple other cases we need to get through. Um, so this case is a little bit more uh, difficult and but certainly relevant to uh, I think all ophthalmologists here. So my attempt at a movie uh, title is Gone But Not Forgotten. So this is a 52 year old woman who's referred for left eye vision loss. She's healthy and does not take any regular medications. And she described a one week history 
of left eye blurred vision and soreness around the eye. So she's 20-20 in the right eye, 20-40 in her left eye. There is a left RAPD and her color vision is reduced on the left. Her blood pressure is normal and she has no proptosis. So here are the um, fundus photos from the first encounter with us. And what you'll notice is there is left optic disc edema, probably you know, a moderate amount. There are a couple hemorrhages here. And if you look very carefully, the retinal venules are a little bit more dilated and tortuous. So the OCT just shows us that there is, you know, an elevated nerve fiber layer, just as we saw clinically. And the OCT macula shows us that there is some fluid that's starting to track into the near the fovea. So her visual field test um, shows basically a superior, looks like an arcuate like defect in the left eye and was normal in the right eye. So why don't we launch this poll? So this is a, a lady who has one week of left eye vision loss with a little bit of soreness around the eye with optic disc edema and a superior, um, you know, kind of arcuate defect. And so let's just get a feeling of what people think is the most likely diagnosis at this point. All right, we've got about 100 answers in. It's a pretty even split, so I'll end the poll and share the results for you. Okay, so this is good because I certainly, I think based on the information so far, I don't think, you know, it's not fitting into a really nice category here. So, you know, I put optic neuritis here at the top of the differential just because she's describing some discomfort and we know that over 90% of people with optic neuritis have pain with eye movement. Now, it's also possible, you know, maybe this is NAION, it's, she certainly doesn't have the real risk factors for it, but when we asked her about symptoms of obstructive sleep apnea, which, are, you know, are also nonspecific, she did have, you know, daytime fatigue, snoring at night, and possibly some apneic episodes witnessed, so it's possible this is NAION. She does have two cats, so it's possible this is, you know, the beginning of a neuroretinitis. And so, you know, I can't really be so confident right at this point what exactly is going on. I also put compressive optic neuropathy. It's rare to have symptoms come on so fast. And it's also possible this is infiltrative, but she really has no history of systemic disease for us to consider this. So I would agree the top three of our differential is optic neuritis, NAION, and infectious neuroretinitis. So we ordered an MRI of the orbits and brain with gadolinium to help us decide what this is. We got a CBC, Bartonella, VDRL, and we did get NMO and MOG antibodies. And we asked her to see her family doctor to assess to see whether she really does have sleep apnea or not. Now, two weeks later, her vision gradually worsens to the point where it's no light perception. So we bring her back right in to see us again. And you can see here that we have more optic disc edema here, a few cotton wool spots on the disc, and a couple of hemorrhages here. And when we compare the first visit to the second visit, you can see that clinically the disc edema is worsening. There doesn't seem to be much else going on in the retina apart from our retinal venules, which are a little bit dilated and tortuous. Okay, so we repeat the OCT, and you can see that the fluid is tracking even more into the fovea, and this just Goes, this is you know, related to the increasing optic disc edema that we're seeing. So we have some test results. We have a normal CBC. We have a normal Bartonella. VDRL is negative. She does not have sleep apnea. We did not get our MRI yet since uh, we ordered this as an outpatient, and we still don't have our antibodies for aquaporin 4 and MOG. So now she's NLP. This is obviously an urgent situation. So we admitted her to the hospital to get the uh, rest of the workup. But what do people think now? on the most likely diagnosis, given now that she's no light perception. Okay, so it looks like, um, so it looks like we got less optic neuritis now. The leading uh, cause here is an infectious neuroretinitis. And some people are gonna are starting to go with other. So at this case, you know, we still put uh, you know a severe optic neuritis at the top of the differential here. Certainly, you know, anti-mog, um, maybe less so acaporin 4 can cause you know really severe optic disc edema, NLP vision. That's certainly possible. 
Um, you know, it could be something else we just don't know about. So we put infiltrative as the second leading cause, but it's also possible infectious or compressive. Um, it would have to be something really aggressive right behind the globe if it was compressive. But at this point, we really need our MRI to help us. So um, here's the MRI. So this is a T1 post-gadolinium image, and you can really see the issue here. So this is the right optic nerve, which is normal, and you can see it's kind of a dark color. And the left optic nerve is all white. So there is very severe enhancement of the optic nerve and you can actually see the disc edema on the MRI. You can see that the optic nerve sheath appears to be particularly enhancing and thickened. So there was nothing else in her brain, no demyelination, no other abnormal lesions. It was only this left optic nerve, which was severely enhanced. So we reviewed this with our radiologist and they called it thickening and enhancement of the left optic nerve with surrounding fat stranding and optic discupping. They probably mean optic disc edema. But their differential included really inflammatory conditions. So they're telling us this looks like optic neuritis and it's not typical really for anything else. So we got a few other tests. Basically, all the infectious workup here has been negative and she feels well, there's no fever. So it's making infection much, much less likely. We still don't have our NMO and MOG antibodies. And so we decide, we put optic neuritis at the top of our differential and we treated her with steroids. So we gave her one gram of methylprednisolone daily for five days and then we treated her with oral afterwards. So our working diagnosis here is a severe atypical optic neuritis. So we gave her a good seven to 10 days of steroids and she is still NLP and she has increasing discomfort in her left eye. So we bring her back in and now you can see that something looks different here. So maybe we can ask on a resident here to describe the fundus photos in the left eye. Sure, let's go with Amrit this time. <laughs> uh, sure, so this is a patient that I haven't seen. Um, but <laughs> so this is a, so we have two fundus photos, one just zoomed in and basically um, there's, more hemorrhages than we saw previously. And also looks like there's a cherry red spot and some ischemia in the posterior pole, suggestive of maybe a uh, central retinal artery occlusion, uh, maybe from whatever was infiltrating the nerve is now compressing the artery uh, to a greater degree. Yeah, so that's, that's pretty much it. So we have worsening optic disc edema with more hemorrhages on the nerve. We have a central retinal artery occlusion since we have uh, you know, all this retinal edema and a cherry red spot. So um, this is not the way that um, optic neuritis is supposed to go. So we repeated the MRI given how worse she was. And now we see that the enhancement is mainly around the nerve. So it's the optic nerve sheath. And a lot of that enhancement in the nerve itself is actually gone. So when the radiologists read this report, they said that there's decreasing enhancement and they still favor an inflammatory, infectious, or perineuritis, and the brain is still normal. So we have this, now our tests are more complete. So we know that the aquaporin-4 and MOG antibodies are negative, and we do have CSF now, and there are three and five non-erythroid cells. Protein was slightly elevated, so this is all you know, kind of non-specific. And there were no signs of malignancy based on the flow cytometry and cytology. So we're still not really any further than we were ahead before. So we have a patient who's definitely clinically worse, radiologically better. And so now what, is the, what are people thinking here? So this is where you really have to put the clinical together with the radiology, because if the radiologist just looked like this, they would say the patient's you know, improving. But we know we treated her with steroids, her vision's not better, she has more pain, and now there's you know, ischemic damage to her eye. So Jonathan, so just a question while the poll is running. Someone's asking, Gareth is asking if syphilis was checked. Syphilis was checked twice in the serum and in the CSF, both negative. HIV is negative. And there's also a question of CMV from Austin. CMV is a good thought. The patient, um, you know, is not, she, her HIV is negative and there is no, um, there's no 
vitreous cell and the peripheral retina does not show any signs of uh, necrotizing retinitis. It's really just a central retinal artery occlusion. Okay, and is there any role for MRI spine? Maybe thinking- Certainly MRI, MRI spine is, is a good thought um, and we'll go through that soon. Okay, so most patients are, most people are thinking systemic vasculitis here with the next most common infectious retinitis. So um, what tests would you order now? Let's put up the next poll. So if some people mentioned MRI spine already, so there's an option there. Okay, so most people would order an MRI spine at this point with um, CT, chest, and abdomen being next. Okay, so we first have to go through our differential diagnosis here. There is no way this can be optic neuritis. So this patient is clearly getting worse now with steroids. There's no signs of demyelination in her brain. The antibodies are negative, and there has really been no case report where you get a central retinal artery occlusion after steroids and clear worsening with optic neuritis. So we're, we're going to cross that off our list. It, this patient's had a pretty thorough infectious workup. She's HIV negative, you know, syphilis, um, you know, our, our TB tests, all our infectious workup is negative and she looks well. So it doesn't really make sense for this to be an infectious etiology. So at the top of our list now is an infiltrative optic neuropathy. So there is probably some sort of cancer in the nerve. That's, it can only explain how aggressive and fast this was and the fact that it did not respond to steroids and the fact that we got another, an entirely negative workup so far. So we now have to think, is this some sort of metastasis or is this primary? It certainly doesn't look like primary um, based on the radiology so far. So we're thinking this is probably some sort of metastatic disease. And so the next test we ordered here was a CT chest and um, abdomen. Now, MRI of the spine, we do order that often for um, you know, severe optic neuritis, especially if you think there's um, animal spectrum disorder and the patient has other neurological findings. But in this case, I think we, we're not really suspecting aquaporin-4 disease at this point, given how severe and relentless this is and not, with no response to steroids and negative antibodies. So I think here, the issue here is trying to get some tissue. And so we did a CT of her chest and abdomen, and you can see the yellow arrows are pointing to multiple lesions in the liver. And when we look at the lung here, there's another solitary nodule. And so the radiologists are saying that this is suspicious for metastasis of unknown primary, and they don't think it's lymphoma. So luckily we do have the interventional radiologist can go after those liver lesions and they can get us an answer. So here are four strips of the liver. And you can see we can't really, if you look carefully here, you'll see that some of these strips here are highly pigmented. And when we put a special stain here um, for melanocyte markers, you can see how the melanin really shows up in this part of the liver. And so the final diagnosis here by the pathologist is metastatic melanoma. So we get this diagnosis here and the question is, how did this lady get metastatic melanoma? Well, when we asked her, she did have a mole removed from her upper back more than 10 years ago. So we tracked down the pathology report and she had a malignant melanoma on the skin of her upper back more than 10 years ago. So just over 10 years ago. And this was a very tiny melanoma. So the height, the, so one of the most important factors when you have a melanoma is how deep is the melanoma invading? And this was 0.68 millimeters, so very, very small. So the patient was referred at that time to plastic surgery who removed the residual tissue around that melanoma, and there was nothing residual there. So the final diagnosis for this case is a late recurrence of upper back cutaneous melanoma with metastasis to the optic nerve, liver, and lung, which is, you know, incredibly rare and shocking. So just to put this in perspective, she had a 0.68 millimeter depth melanoma, which is extremely small. This is barely a T1A, so that this is the earliest stage you could possibly have of cutaneous melanoma. And so if we look at one of the seminal papers in dermatology, 
by Breslow, he took almost 100 patients and he looked at the risk of metastasis based on depth. And he found no patients who had a depth of 0.76 millimeters or less that had metastatic disease. So if someone has a thin melanoma, it's called less than one millimeter, basically all you need to do is excise it with one centimeter margin. So really you don't need to do a lymph node biopsy that's typically reserved for patients with thicker disease. So just to put this into even more perspective, how rare this is, this is a study that a meta-analysis of over 10,000 patients who had a thin melanoma on their skin, less than one millimeter, and there, there was a rate of metastasis of 4.5%. Uh, there are some risk factors for metastasis, even with tiny melanomas, and you can see that our patient actually never had any of these. So there's obviously other prognostic factors other than the depth, probably some, some changes in the pathology that can be seen or genetic factors that influence whether these tiny melanomas can uh, metastasis. So it is known, melanoma is known to do this. So cutaneous melanoma can re reappear over 10 years after it's been treated and resected. So our ocular oncology colleagues know this very well. So in the comms trial, even after enucleation, people have gotten metastasis 10 years later. You can even have something called ultra late recurrence. So you remove the melanoma and the melanoma comes back, you know, decades later. The, the, the farthest uh, metastasis I was able to find was 29 years after presentation. And ocular is more likely to do this than cutaneous. So just look at this case here. This is a 52 year old man who had an ocular melanoma and he was enucleated. Then 23 years later, he comes to the emergency room with seizures and they find a metastasis in his brain from the melanoma. So this is just shows you how crazy and unpredictable melanoma can be. So what is this tumor doing for 10 years? Where does it go and how is it, what is it doing? So there's a term called tumor dormancy, which basically refers to the tumor is sleeping in the body and it doesn't manifest itself. And so how does this happen? We really don't know, but there's a number of theories. For example, it's possible that the immune system is keeping the, the melanoma in check. So the immune system's kind of holding the size and it's not really growing or, or manifesting with symptoms. It's also possible that the tumor settles in, but it doesn't have an, enough angiogenic factors and get enough blood supply to really proliferate. It's also possible that maybe these melanomas break off from the original tumor very early and so they don't have the pathways to be really aggressive at that time, which changes later on. This is still an area of research and something that people um, are still not sure about. So there really are no, uh, you know, not many cases of optic nerve metastasis from melanoma. This is one case that we found in the literature of a 23 year old man who had known metastatic disease from melanoma and known brain metastasis who presented with vision loss. But we were able, unable to find any, um, you know, uh, case like ours, and certainly not after a melanoma on the skin that was less than one millimeter. So our patient is, was referred for radiation therapy to the optic nerve. That's really to help with comfort since she was having some pain and we don't want that tumor proliferating in her orbit. She was referred to medical oncology at PMH and she is in a clinical trial and she's being treated with checkpoint inhibitors. So Alex Kaplan did a nice rounds on this a few weeks ago. And so these two molecules are basically monoclonal antibodies against um, inhibitors of T cells. So when you inhibit the T cell, you're trying to upregulate the immune system and try to get that immune system to help with removing the cancer. The issue here with this is there are a lot of autoimmune side effects. And so Alex went through some cases where patients get uveitis, you can even get optic neuritis or um, um, myasthenia gravis related to this. And so this patient actually did have an autoimmune complication. She got autoimmune hepatitis and was treated with intravenous and oral steroids. And now we're just waiting to see whether this treatment has had any effect on her liver and lungs. So this was the last picture we have before her radiation. And you can see that there is resolving edema and the optic disc edema is resolving. So the lessons from this case, which we all certainly learned, whoever was involved, is that if someone has a history of melanoma, it doesn't matter how long ago she, they had it, and it doesn't matter how big it was, because it can still present later on in life, even decades later. 
So in this case, you know, the patient did have enhancement of the optic nerve and the optic nerve sheath. I see there's a question of was this leptomeningeal disease? So probably the metastasis was to the optic nerve sheath. And that enhancement we were seeing was, you know, secondary involvement of the optic nerve. So in a sense, it is involving the sheath there. Um, but, you know, the radiologist really never suspected it. You know, when we look at it in retrospect, it did look more thick and more inflamed than we normally see with optic neuritis. But I don't think anyone would have been able to tell this was metastatic melanoma from her first presentation. And this case also shows that it's important to see how patients evolve and how they respond to treatment. And you need to refine your differential diagnosis to help in um, you know, coming to your final diagnosis. Okay, are there any? Um... So Jonathan, we've got a couple um, experts on, on this call. It's nice to have um, provincial and national attendance. So we've got James Farmer and I've unmuted him and he, he made a comment, um, but I'm hoping he can just verbalize. James, yeah, you there? I, I, yeah, I'm here. Thank you very much. It's a phenomenal case. My point is when the vision decreased to no light perception, a consideration could have been to optic nerve sheath biopsy because it's quite an extensive involvement of the nerve sheath and it doesn't completely eliminate the possibility this could be another tumor, although one doesn't like to postulate two, but we had a recent case of a malignant hemangiopericytoma that presented in a very similar fashion that was actually diagnosed on optic nerve sheath biopsy. So that's a consideration, especially when a vision drops to no light perception and is unresponsive to treatment, as in this case. Yeah, that's a good point. Now, the only problem, though, is when the patient presented with no light perception initially, there, there, we couldn't eliminate the fact that this could have been a severe optic neuritis. Um, you know, certainly this has been described with aquaporin disease and MOG. So we don't want to jump too quickly to optic nerve biopsy right off the bat, because there is a possibility that this is just a severe optic neuritis and it may respond to steroids. So if we biopsy it, we're pretty much putting that nerve at toast, um, to toast. So I agree though, that we did consider biopsying the optic nerve in this case. Um, this was you know, a decision that was made with the oncology team, the patient themselves, um, you know, and radiation oncology. And given the likelihood here, it was, and we found another easier place to biopsy, I think the role for optic nerve biopsy, you know, was considered less. The patient decided not to proceed with that way, but it's certainly, you know, a reasonable thing to biopsy the optic nerve in this case. But it was felt that given we have, you know, a unifying diagnosis, we already have tissue and there's no alternative cause. Um, we decided to just biopsy the liver and go with that, but it's certainly reasonable to biopsy the optic nerve sheath in that case. But I probably wouldn't do it right off the bat with NLP because there is a, we didn't have a diagnosis and it's possible that we may have got some vision back. Now, you know, in retrospect, we could probably could have done the CT chest, abdomen, pelvis earlier in the course of this disease, but you know, this is where, you know, this would require longer admission, depends on the patient's feelings about this, um, but we certainly could have considered, you know, the CT of the chest and abdomen a little bit earlier on in the course. I think that's just one quick, one quick comment. We had an optic nerve sheath penetration that picked up a metastatic um, breast cancer as well. So, and that <laughs> yeah. didn't involve actually nerve parenchyma. Yes, yes, that's, yeah, that's, <laughs> that's, a, that's another great case. And yeah, it does happen. The optic nerve sheath is a site of metastasis. Okay, just a comment from Leonard Levine as well. He's on the oh, line that, here. If, that was a very fascinating case and obviously very sad. One quick question, which is uh, melanin is one of a very small number of uh, substances that can actually cause a high signal on T1 uh, without, you know, with, before the administration of gadolinium. And on retrospect, if you look back at the, the T1 pre-contrast images, is there any uh, high signal? Um, I, though, so the T1 without contrast didn't have fat suppression in it, so it's, it's hard to um, compare but I don't recall there being high signal in the nerve itself. Um, but I, that's another thing I'll go back and look at to see if that was the case. Sure. Yeah, it's going to be hard because of the, it's probably mostly going to be in the, uh, um, the, the, the sheath. sheath. And, and yeah. what happened in the nerve is probably just a result of the abnormality of the sheath basically causing a kind of a partial infarction of the nerve. So yeah, without fat suppression, it's really tough. Yeah. Okay, and we've got one last comment from Ed Margolin. Oh, I was going to make a comment? Okay. 
Oh, oh just uh, my comment your was only my comment was only that if you look at the at the at the initial MR, the enhancement is very kind of not something you would typically see in optic neuritis. It's only easy to say this in retrospect because it's kind of irregular. It's the nerve is no, very, agree, yeah. very thick. It's yeah. uh, you know you would look at it back and say like this is kind of really a very weird looking nerve. For no, I agree with you in retrospect, kind of, and I felt a little bit uncomfortable during this case calling it optic neuritis. Right. It is more thick than you would the nervous see. Thick. I agree. That's right. But you know, MOG, MOG disease causes you know such great enhancement that's too, right. right? So that's why Attention. you know right. my I was always thinking this was MOG and a severe MOG. That's why. Right. Um, but I agreed. That's where you know, and I talked to you know a number of expert neuroradiologists who were who were not you really going tell. that way. So, and you can't really tell, but yeah, but I agree. It's, it's an unusual looking nerve. I mean, I'm only saying that because we had a um, kind of a case recently where the nerve looked like this, but a little bit more homogeneous, but super thick. Um, and then the enhancement um, persisted in the thickening in a month. And uh, anyways, and eventually it turned out to be um, primary malignant glioma of the op optic nerve. So just kind yeah, so of an unusual looking nerve. Yeah, some people are asking what MOG is. So MOG is a myelin oligodendrocyte glycoprotein. So there's antibodies against, against this protein, which is in the optic nerve sheath. And this has been recently discovered to cause us, you know, an op a severe optic neuritis, and it can cause other neurolytic NMO spectrum disorder symptoms. So when we talk about MOG, this is an antibody against the optic nerve sheath that was recently discovered. And MOG, the antibody to MOG can cause a severe optic neuritis. So when we see a patient with optic neuritis, uh, especially if it's severe, we test the serum for these antibodies to help us with the diagnosis. So that's what MOG is. Okay, so I have, I know we're at one o'clock. I don't know, I have one more case. I guess, um, you know, since we're not on video, we could probably go ahead with it if people... Um, I think we have the time, but let's, let's go ahead with it. Okay. So um, the last two cases are here, they're kind of two companion cases that go together. And my title here is the problems become the solutions and you'll see what I mean as we go through. So this is a 46 year old woman referred for bilateral optic disc edema and she has a history of uh, end stage renal disease and she had a renal transplant 15 years ago from focal segmental glomerulosclerosis and she also has hypertension. She is not obese. And these are her medications you can see on the side here. So she has just a few month history of low grade headaches and a swishing sound in her noise in her uh, ears for a few months. And basically she really didn't have any visual symptoms and her visual function was normal. And so these are her optic nerves and you can see that there's a moderate amount of bilateral optic disc edema. So just a reminder, we can see a patient who has bilateral optic disc edema and normal visual function. We think this is where we think and the most likely um, thing that's going on is papilledema. Now, it doesn't mean papilledema doesn't cause abnormal function. Certainly, if it's severe or lasts a long time, you can get reduced vision. But in the presence of normal vision, we think papilledema. So the question for this case is, why does this patient who had a renal transplant have papilledema? And so our differential diagnosis is listed here. So it could be a mass, it could be related to her medication, could be a meningeal process, it could be a clot, or it could be idiopathic, but that is definitely an, uh, a diagnosis of exclusion. So we got her an MRI of the brain and an MRV, and all we're seeing are signs consistent with chronically raised intracranial pressure. You can see that she has an empty cella, which is flattening of the pituitary gland here, and she has some stenosis of the distal transverse sinuses, and these are all signs suggestive of raised ICP. So she has a lumbar puncture, and the opening pressure is 40 centimeters of water, which is high. She, her headache gets better with the lumbar puncture, and there's nothing else going on in the CSF. So we've confirmed now that we have papilledema, since we have the opening pressure that's high. We know there's no mass. We know there's nothing going on in the CSF, and we know there's no thrombosis. So we're now left, is this a medication or is this idiopathic? And so why don't we launch the poll here and people can vote on which medication they think is the problem here. Okay, so 
most people um, are getting the answer right here. Okay, so cyclosporin is certainly known to cause raised intracranial pressure, and there are numerous cases in the literature, um, you know, reporting a documented um, relationship between raised intracranial pressure and the use of cyclosporin. And so our patient, it was a little unusual that she was on it for seven years, and this only happened seven years later, but cyclosporin is certainly known to cause raised intracranial pressure. The mechanism of this is not exactly known. So we asked the transplant team if they could switch her medication to a suitable alternative. And so they changed it to tacrolimus. And you can see here that her optic disc edema basically goes away. And this happened pretty quick with, within a month. So this is good evidence that cyclosporin was the cause and she's doing well on tacrolimus. So our, this case was unusual in one respect that it would happened, you know, seven years after the use of cyclosporin, which hasn't been reported before. And shout out to Jason, who's a resident in Cabaret, who's a medical student who did a, you know, a very big literature review on this and our case report was published. And so basically the final diagnosis here is papilledema secondary to cyclosporin use that was successfully treated with the switch to tacrolimus. So let's just uh, launch another poll here. What other medication should we think about when someone presents with papilledema or symptoms of raised intracranial pressure? And so cyclosporin is certainly one, but it's probably not the most common we see. Um, so I think everyone's seeing this poll here and looks like over 90% of the people here are getting the answer. So it's definitely isoretinoin. So two things I just wanna make you aware of, just to remember, we think of vitamin A derivatives, Accutane commonly used for acne, Atra is something used for acute promyelocytic leukemia or eat people taking excessive supplementation. Um, another thing to think about are tetracyclines, and these are often used for uh, acne. Sometimes even we use this in ophthalmology for someone with blepharitis or bad ocular surface disease. So this is a case report that shows that even using topical vitamin A derivatives can give you raised intracranial pressure and severe papilledema. And so this was a case of a non-obese 33 year old who just used vitamin A creams who got you know, severe papilledema and visual compromise. Okay, so we have another case that's kind of in the same realm of our other one. So now we have a 60 year old man who's referred for bilateral optic disc edema. Instead of a renal transplant, he had a cardiac transplant for ischemic cardiomyopathy six months prior to when we saw him and also has a history of chronic kidney disease. And you see his medications on the side here and you can see that there is no cyclosporin here. So he has five months of progressive blurred vision in both eyes and his left eye became worse over the past 10 days. So the transplant team thought this was related to atovaquone and they stopped it, but this had no effect on his visual function. So when we saw him first, his visual acuity was 20-25 in the right, 20-50 in the left, and there was a left RAPD. Now here are the fields here. So you can see that his left visual field is severely constricted and his right eye has a bit of an enlarged blind spot and uh, you know, a nasal step. So when we dilated his fundus, we see that there is bilateral optic disc edema. It's probably a moderate amount. The left looks more pale and this fits with the fact that he's had the symptom in the left a little longer and we have a peripapillary hemorrhage here and here. So there's nothing else really going on in the retina. There's no uveitis. So it's simply a bilateral optic disc edema that looks more pallid in the left with progressive vision loss. And you can see our OCT thickness here is quite thick, 442 and 330. So if we launch this poll here, this patient has papilledema, bilateral optic neuropathy is not related to papilledema or not sure. So this is a bit of, this is a hard question here. I actually, I don't think we can be so sure here. So I, this certainly could be consistent with chronic papilledema. In fact, the patient's visual fields are kind of typical of what we see. So the left one is more chronic and there's constricted visual field and the right one has an enlarged blind spot and nasal step. So it certainly possibly could be papilledema. It's also possible this is not related to papilledema. So for me at this point, I'm still not sure and we need more tests. So this patient has bilateral optic neuropathies, but it's possible that the bilateral optic neuropathies are related to chronic papilledema. It could also be toxic, medication related. Because he's immunosuppressed, we need to think about infection and possibly ischemic, but certainly his 
course here is chronic and not sudden, so that's less likely. So it was difficult to get him an MRI because he has a pacemaker and the CT was reported to be normal and the radiologist did not think there were signs of high pressure. So we got him a lumbar puncture and the opening pressure was 12 centimeters of water. It was done in the left lateral decubitus position without any technical issues. And so we were quite confident at this point that it's not raised intracranial pressure. We did testing for infectious causes in the CSF and his blood and those were negative and the rest of the workup was all negative. So one week later, he still kind of has this constricted visual field in the left eye, and it looks like an enlarged blind spot in the right eye and some other nonspecific depressed points, and he's still having the significant optic disc edema. So at this point here, we're crossing out papilledema as the cause, and we're really thinking, is this possible that this is tacrolimus? So this patient was on tacrolimus since the um, heart transplant six months ago. So we were able to get him an MRI and basically there was nothing infiltrating the optic nerves, there was no enhancement and nothing else going on in the brain and the MRV was also normal. So at this point in time here we're thinking he's on a lot of medications, he just had a transplant, so the question is which medication is the likely problem here? Okay, so probably from the title, you could have figured this out here. And so this is actually less well known than um, cyclosporin, but certainly tacrolimus is becoming, becoming to be recognized as certainly a cause of optic uh, neuropathy. And you can see this recent uh, case series of three patients in the Journal of Neuropathology had, you know, this patient kind of looks like ours. There's optic disc edema, a constricted visual field, and uh, a little bit more asymmetric than our case and pallor in the other eye. And so there have been 12 cases in the literature reported so far. This can happen anywhere from two months to several years after starting the medication. And usually it can still happen with normal serum levels. And the good news is most patients have improvement with drug cessation. So we don't really know the mechanism of this yet. And there was one case that had an optic nerve biopsy. So this is a 63 year old man who had a kidney transplant five years prior to presentation, who had severe bilateral vision loss, hand motions in the right eye, no light perception in the left eye, and there was enhancement of the optic nerve. So because they weren't sure what was going on, they biopsied the nerve. And all it showed was loss of myelin um, without any changes in the vasculature. So it was hypothesized that this was likely an ischemic optic neuropathy in nature, but that was not supported by the pathology here. And this patient unfortunately did not recover vision in the right eye. So in our case, the transplant team was consulted and we asked them to find an alternative to tacrolimus. And so this patient was started on cyclosporin. So both have similar mechanisms. For the ophthalmology residents, this is a common OCAP question, is how does cyclosporin work? And the answer on your test will be inhibits IL-2. So they both work by reducing T cell activity, mainly through the IL-2 cytokine. So we stopped this patient's cyclosporin, it was switched to tacrolimus, it was switched to cyclosporin, you can see that his vision did improve. So this is four months later and he's 20-25 in both eyes, and you can see that his visual field is starting to open up and he certainly felt subjectively better. And this is our, his final fundus photos. You can see that the disc edema has resolved and there's now residual pallor. So the final diagnosis here is bilateral optic neuropathy secondary to tacrolimus use and was successively treated with switch to cyclosporin. And that's why our title here was the problem become the solutions. Okay, any questions for this last case? Okay, thank you, Jonathan. That, that, that was an incredible grand rounds and thank you for being our first um, virtual lecturer for the Department of Ophthalmology grand rounds. Um, I want to thank Jonathan for doing this on such short notice. It, 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 he had to be very nimble. I also want to thank uh, Sandra Gauchi, uh, Alan Slomovic, John Lloyd and Sharif al Defrawi for helping put this together. And I think Alan's gonna say a few words to help um, to, sorry, to close out this meeting. Thanks, Amandeep. Um, Jonathan, I want to just reiterate what was said. Those were fantastic rounds. 
as evidenced by the fact that we had over 200 people attending. I think that's probably a record for our Grand Rounds. And also the fact that everyone was so engaged with your presentations, uh, all the questions, and just want to thank you very much. I just want to uh, also thank Amandeep, Sharif, and John. I think uh, everything come together really nicely. We will be continuing on with Grand Rounds on a regular basis every Friday, 12 noon, roughly till one o'clock. Um, and you're all invited to attend. Uh, we encourage the participation. I want to also wish everyone um, keep safe. I know uh, our mayor's going to, our, our premier's are, are actually is going to be coming out with some models of how this disease is shaping up. And just want to wish everyone all the best to you and your loved ones. And I look forward to Grand Rounds next week. The title will be COVID-19. We're going to have somebody from infectious diseases who's been on the TV quite a bit lately. We're also going to be having an uh, ER doc going to speak about what's happening in the emergency room. So thanks once again, Jonathan, and to everyone else, keep safe.